You're listening to the Pentaract Poetry Podcast, hosted by Anthony Etherin. Welcome to episode 25 of the Pentaract Podcast. Joining me this time are Christian Book, Pedro Poitevin, and Nick Montfort in the discussion of computational poetry, constraint-based poetry, linguistics, mathematics, and science. I began by asking my guests to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Book, and I'm the author of Unoya, uh, a work of procedural constraint uh, that has gone on to enjoy some global renown over the last 20 years. I believe that I'm on this podcast because I have a special interest in the relationship between science and poetics. Uh, I love mathematics and might very well have become a mathematician if I had not decided to follow my bliss rather than my skills. Uh, pursuing an interest in poetry rather than an interest in um, mathematics. Uh, I've certainly uh, written a lot of poetry that is informed by uh, scientific procedures. And uh, over the last 20 years since the publication of Inoya, I've been working on a project that is effectively a scientific experiment performed for artistic purposes, uh, requiring me to genetically engineer an organism so that it might become uh, an enduring repository for a poem. I certainly think that science is one of the most important things that we do as a culture, probably the most important thing that we do as a culture collectively. And uh, I hope uh, that in the 21st century, poets might take a greater interest in the socio-technological circumstances of life in their culture. Okay, great. And uh, Pedro? Hello, I'm Pedro Poitevan, and I am a mathematician and also a poet, an experimental poet. Um, I am interested in constraint as well. Uh, so I write very constraint, heavily constrained texts uh, informed often by ideas in mathematics or by aesthetic sensibilities that come from mathematics. And uh, that is why I am here today. And Nick. Hi, I'm a poet. Um, I also work in scholarship of digital media and creative computing, but uh, my relevant work today um, would have to be my computer-generated books of poetry, most recently Golem, The True List, Autopia, uh, collaboration called Two by Six is another one, and uh, Shebang, which is number sum exclamation point. Um, I've done a bunch of digital projects, uh, The Deletionist, Sea and Spar Between, and Renderings being three collaborative ones. And um, my interests are in the sciences of the artificial, as Herb Simon put it, um, not in the natural sciences so much as, for instance, Christian work, Christian's work deals with. So I work in computer science in its application and engagement with language, literature, um, and also the specificities historically and materially of different computer platforms. So um, I'm interested in the materialities of the book and the specificities of how to uh, produce computer-generated books that manifest themselves as codices. Uh, but I'm also interested in how to write constrained computer programs for the Apple II or the Commodore 64, for instance, that can do the sorts of things that those computers were designed to do and can explore the possibilities of these systems that were very popular and influential in culture. Thank you. So I'm glad you mentioned constraint because that's where I want to begin. A lot of people who write constraint-based poetry are interested in mathematics or at least they're gifted mathematicians in some way. And when people ask me why this is, it's actually quite hard to explain what the connection is between constraints and mathematics. Uh, I know that Pedro has some ideas on this, if you don't mind sharing them. Sure. So there is, there is a particular concept in, in mathematics, in, actually in mathematical logic, um, which is called definability. And uh, so the idea is that in, in all of mathematics, there are different fields in mathematics. There's algebra, there's analysis, there's geometry, etc. And um, different fields use different first order languages. So there's, there's a first order language and you have add symbols. So there's a lot of, there's a connection between syntax and semantics already from the point of view of the logician. And uh, 
it turns out that it's very interesting to ask questions like what kinds of objects are definable within these restricted languages? And one of the deepest connections that there is in between logic and geometry is precisely through that concept of definability. So if you have, for example, you're studying groups, which is a, a mathematical concept, you have certain symbols available in the language for groups. And there are certain formulas that describe objects that live inside of groups. And those, those objects that live inside of groups are so-called definable objects. Now, uh, not everything is definable. So, so geometric objects, for example, ellipses and circles and so on are definable because they are so the solution sets of certain formulas. And so th the very natural question for a mathematician to ask is what are the definable objects in a particular structure? And the same is true when you consider poetry. And for example, I, I, I love Christian's uh, point about limit cases. That's another interesting connection between mathematics and poetry. We mathematicians derive deep mathematical insights from exploring limit cases. In, in, in particular situations, we look at uh, limit cases to derive intuitions about the totality of the phenomena that we are exploring. And one of the most important questions that mathematicians ask themselves is what is definable in a structure? The same thing is happening when you constrain natural languages, which are not first order languages. They are, they are natural languages like English or French or Spanish, uh, but you constrain them somewhat and you ask yourself, what kind of literary projects are achievable? What kind of things can you do with those more constrained uh, languages? Thank you. Well, who wants to go next? I'm sure you've both got some views on this. Uh, Nick? Yeah, there's lots to say. Uh, there's things to say about uh, the relationship between computer science, the sciences of the artificial, and, uh, and mathematics, and um, ideas about correspondences between proof and computer program, for instance. Um, although at a basic uh, sort of level, right, one of the things that people are confused about a, a lot of times about computing is they think you have to be good at math in a conventional sense, like, you know, be able to do um, calculation uh, or be able to understand uh, how to integrate and uh, differentiate things like this. And of course, the computer does this for you. So people who are bad at math can be computer scientists. They can go off to computer science in, in a lot of cases. Um, but with regard to constraint, you know, I'm glad that... Uh, Pedro um, was uh, talking about mathematical objects very generally rather than the sort of narrow case of uh, constraint satisfaction um, that uh, is done in computing in certain situations. I think about the different types of constraints. So constrained writing, a practice that I've undertaken, and of course that we all have, is uh, something that produces a subset of the language in, that we're interested in. Um, and it uh, allows us to produce texts that might be delirious, uncanny, uh, otherwise very provocative, uh, compelling, and unusual. And this actually goes back um, not only before the 20th century avant-garde, but uh, all the way back before written language. So I was... Uh, going through um, Eric Havelock's preface to Plato recently and his discussion of how it is that in oral cultures and oral practices, you would have bards, the Homeric um, poets, for instance, right, who were transmitting cultural knowledge based on what was repeatable in that culture and therefore what was metrical, what was rhythmical, and as Havelock puts it, there are millions of different things that can't be said in metrical and rhythmic language that, that can be said in general. Um, and because of that, the constraint that you place on what a Homeric bard, for instance, can say, because it has to be rhythmic, it has to be metrical, it has to be mnemonic, right? is actually a constraint on the way the entire culture thinks and the way that cultural knowledge gets propagated. Um, so there's very deep uh, and broad implications to constraint. And instead of just being sort of edge cases of experimentation, 
which I also think are very, very important and uh, show us things uh, that we wouldn't otherwise know about, um, they pertain to the very essence of uh, culture, the transmission of knowledge, and how poetics factors into that. So I think of, of constraint as having a broad range of you know, what it meant um, uh, in primary oral cultures all the way up to what it means to write um, a one-line basic program for the Apple II or the Commodore 64, uh, which has a great deal of specificity, but also at the same time, cultural implications and cultural resonance. One of the uh, kind of mathematical notions though that I would probably bring to bear upon the idea of constraints is that uh, it also uh, lends us um, an aesthetic dimension to uh, this, this work uh, through the idea of elegance. The mathematicians and, uh, and even computer programmers will of course point to uh, mathematical objects or computer programs and speak uh, about their elegance. And they almost always have something to do with the uh, um, nature of the constraint uh, under which they operate. Um, Lulipo, I think, was very clever to uh, actually uh, define what would constitute an elegant use of constraints by placing rules upon those rules. That, in effect, you know, elegance might, in mathematics might have something to say about uh, the rules that are imposed upon rules, the way in which we judge the merits of a proof uh, or a program. For example, uh, the constraint it has to be simple to articulate. Uh, that's a constraint upon the constraint. Moreover, the constraint should be difficult to actually perform, uh, that it has to be hard to accomplish, a challenging constraint. That if uh, deployed, uh, uh, the constraint should be exhaustive. It should somehow uh, cover the largest field of potential available and effectively be a perfect limit case of that uh, procedure so that nobody else has to revisit it. You've done it once and uh, demonstrated it perfectly. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, ideally, the constraint should refer to itself. It should be able to speak uh, uh, cognizantly and, and explicitly about itself while it's performing itself. So there's a self-reflexive dimension to it that I, I think characterizes much of the language of mathematics in, in its own kind of meta-mathematic registers. Um, and then there's always there's two optional constraints. You know, one in which, of course, that you, in formulating the constraint, you don't actually perform it, you don't do it. Right? You just allow other people to then fulfill it. Uh, but ideally, you'd like there to be at least one occasion, one case uh, that demonstrates the thing in practice. And, uh, or alternatively, you break the constraint uh, with one optional deviancy, uh, a Kleinemann, uh, as they called it, uh, a little flaw in the perfect carpet uh, that doesn't have to be there, but you've introduced it uh, out of the blue. Now, those are six rules uh, that were formulated by Ulipo that I think characterize the most elegant productions of that group, that we evaluate the merits of the poem based upon the quality of the constraints that have been imposed upon it and the degree to which those constraints actually demonstrate something like these principles of, of uh, definability, computability. Uh, to me, I, I think that they should be generative, uh, that they offer permissions and potentials, right? They unlock potential and that this contributes to our understanding of them as elegant. These principles of, of Ulipo uh, are fantastic. And one, one thing that comes to mind is uh, Gödel's uh, proof for his incompleteness theorem, mm -hmm. in which he, he writes a, a sentence that specifies that if another sentence is written according to a sequence of steps, so if you follow these steps, there's a sentence, that sentence must not be provable in first order arithmetic. And it turns out that if you perform the sequence of, sent of, of steps that that sentence specifies, the 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 sentence that you obtain is the sentence itself that that Gödel has has uh, written down. That procedure, to me, <laughs> satisfies precisely yeah. the every single one of those constraints. Doesn't every it, single right? one of those constraints makes it so wonderful and elegant, right? That particular it's, proof, so devastating. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is the height of uh, of uh, of elegance, mathematical elegance. There's another idea that isn't articulated as clearly as a principle, but is behind some of the members of the Ulipo's uh, thinking, uh, which is that constraint tells us something about uh, the explicit use of constraint, the explicit setting of constraint for ourselves as writers, um, informs us about the ways in which we are constrained unwittingly. 
uh, when we don't adopt those constraints. Good point. Well, Nick, I, I, I think you've made a, a pretty interesting point to suggest that uh, when you work under a constraint, uh, it may induce in you uh, a self-consciousness about all of the other unspoken constraints uh, that might be imposed upon you when writing a poem. Uh, obviously, when you write a sonnet, uh, there's some explicit constraints, uh, a metrical pattern, a rhyme scheme, uh, uh, you know, a number of lines that you have to deploy. But of course, if you fulfill those uh, immediate constraints, it doesn't mean that you've written a very good sonnet. There are all mm -hmm. kinds of other subsidiary and unspoken constraints that we have to take into account as well. Everything from, I don't know, syntactical novelty and thematic profundity and uh, any number of other um, uh, otherwise unspoken uh, rules. And that perhaps uh, by writing according to some uh, explicit constraint, you might become more self-conscious about those unspoken constraints. And yet, nevertheless, uh, I don't think that that's a, a, a perfect truism because, of course, there are lots of writers who are uh, pretty philistinic and committed to uh, one kind of writing and no others, right? They're not very exploratory. They would say, for example, that writing a sonnet is all you ever have to do and any other kind of poetry is worthless by comparison. And in fact, uh, perhaps many of the more modern forms of writing are dismissible. Uh, uh, and you, because you're happy with the, those constraints, I suppose, that you're, you're quite happy to abide by the cultural, you know, pretensions of your stylistic idiosyncrasies. Um, certainly, I think that style is, is, a, is an expression of a set of unspoken constraints. It's, it constitutes all of the unconscious biases and riffs and uh, idiosyncratic uh, bits of, um, of uh, rule-bound uh, chauvinism that we can't escape, that somehow we're stuck. Right, you know, you know, I have a, I know I have a particular set of proclivities, vocabularies, uh, syntaxes that I have to mobilize in order for it to be a, a work by a Christian book. <laughs> and otherwise, it's not by me. Somehow, it's just not. It's not an expression of, of my own uh, mind. But it could be that those I have to figure out how to defeat. Right, those particular proclivities. I have to figure out how to you know evade some of the worst aspects of my own uh, uh, you know personality. Yeah, I, I, I want to add that, uh, well, first of all, yes, I, I do feel that way sometimes, uh, Nick. I, um, I write under certain constraints and I achieve something that I believe is elegant, for example, and I ask myself immediately, why can't I be this elegant when I am just talking on Zoom with Nick Mumford and Christian Book and, and Anthony Etherin, right? Like, I, I, I can't believe that I am able to do this, to satisfy these constraints and produce something that I find aesthetically pleasing. And in ordinary speech, I am much less articulate. Um, and uh, that's just to mention one example. But I do think that it is interesting, too, to think about how um, the adoption of a constraint um, can inform the way in which you think about a subject. Um, I think you were talking about the Greeks and I, I remember that Empedocles and uh, Parmenides wrote verse. Um, some, some of their philosophical texts are written in verse and, and the structure of the verse sometimes makes reference, explicit reference to the concepts that, that, that these two ancient philosophers are discussing. Mm -hmm. So that the framing of even philosophical thought can be um, affected by poetic uh, choices. Um, it is fascinating. I think it is very important to, to, to think about the prehistoric technology that you're talking about, the meter and, and, and uh, even rhyme uh, as, as, as a technology for the transmission of memory, of, of, of cultural memory and cultural myth, um, and how that, um, that was adopted, even though there are some uh, losses potentially and yet uh, here we are. There's, there's some structured uh, memory that we have as a, as a culture. Um, so yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's fascinating stuff. Yeah, it's, it, for me, I would say in my ordinary speech or ordinary unconstrained writing, uh, if we admit that some writing is unconstrained or if, if we allow for that to happen, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have this tendency to be much more um, metanoic to suggest one thing, but then see if the other thing might be the case. Um, it's very hard when you adopt an austere constraint, I find, to do that, right? I think you tend to drive toward a particular point, maybe with elegance and stylistic beauty that's very unusual and uncanny. Maybe you produce an aesthetic object as you do that, but 
Um, but it does affect what it is you're saying, just as you know, in uh, uh, the times of Homeric oral poets, um, you couldn't uh, not say, you, you, you couldn't say anything about culture, philosophical, historical, instructional, uh, religious, you couldn't say anything about culture except in verse. That was the only way to say it. And so it had to influence, uh, it not only influence, but I would say constrain um, thought itself. And our ability to toy around with constraint and to think about that aside from our you know, ordinary speech, or ordinary writing, um, maybe gives us a different type of uh, consciousness of what constraint does. Yeah, well, we can move on from here to talking about uh, the relevance of meaning itself in constraints, because you can sometimes just create poems for the sake of their structure, mm -hmm. and the meaning doesn't matter. Or you're just serving negative capability, you're serving as the lightning conductor. Yeah, worry about the sound of the sense will follow, right? Yeah, you can talk about the Xenotext here which of course does that with such a difficult constraint. Christian, you didn't really know what the poem was going to say exactly when you started out. I think people know about the Xenotext by now, but if you could give us a quick recap. Uh, the Xenotext uh, is a long-term project still in progress. Uh, it requires that I write a very short poem, and then through a process of encipherment, I translate it into a genetic sequence. And then with the assistance of a laboratory, we implant that uh, gene sequence into uh, the genome of a bacterium, replacing part of its genetic code with my poem, so that now the organism becomes the living embodiment of that text. Um, moreover, I've written the poem in such a way that the organism can actually read the gene sequence and interpret it as a set of instructions for building a sequence of amino acids, a protein, in response. And it just so happens that the uh, protein likewise enciphers a totally different poem that also makes sense. So in effect, I'm designing a bacterium capable of not only storing my poem, but also of writing a poem in response. And these two poems are correlated by a lot of biochemical constraints uh, uh, that are very difficult to fulfill. And uh, uh, when people ask me how I've written these two poems, I describe it as a kind of cryptogram. Uh, imagine uh, assigning a letter to every letter of the alphabet uh, such that those two letters will then be mutually correlated. So if you assign the letter A to T, you have to assign T to A. And if you assign H to E, you have to assign E to H. Um, if you do that for all 26 letters of the alphabet, you get a subset of all the ways in which you can encipher the alphabet. And that subset numbers uh, a little less than 8 trillion variations. There's about 8 trillion different ciphers where you can mutually assign letters to each other in the alphabet. So now, um, Pick one of those ciphers, use a, a heuristic uh, kind of method to you know, make an educated guess and pick one of those uh, ciphers. Now write a poem that makes sense and is beautiful in such a way that if you were to swap out every letter in your poem and replace it with a letter from the cipher, you now get a new poem that's just as beautiful and also makes sense. And uh, as it turns out, uh, out of the eight trillion ciphers, uh, there are not a lot of opportunities to find uh, rich enough lexicons capable of saying meaningful sentences that can be translated into other meaningful sentences. Um, the two poems that I found, I think, are uh, the most optimal. They are the most beautiful. All the other op options are nonsensical. And computer scientists have, in fact, now verified uh, the fitness of my discovery that, in fact, out of the eight trillion possible ciphers at your disposal, most of them don't bear fruit in the form of poetry. There's eight trillion different little worlds uh, where poetry cannot exist. Only one of them has a poem. And to me, there's something that echoes the, uh, the fragility of life right now in our own galaxy. There's probably more than eight trillion different planets. Uh, most of them probably do not harbor complex life, but uh, this one does. And um, it's the only one so far as we know that does. So these poems are they're kind of imminent within the constraint itself. I didn't write them so much as I discovered them as possibilities embedded within uh, the language and its relationship to this particular uh, procedural constraint. The cipher uh, somehow has produced uh, this uncanny vocabulary that uh, when placed in this kind of combination produces two poems that are uh, sensible and uh, refer to each other. Uh, it took four years to write those two texts. I did nothing else for four years, just trying to explore uh, the possibilities afforded by that constraint. 
very, very hard. I, I don't recommend uh, these kinds of projects to my peers. Uh, they're very, very difficult and uh, really uh, uh, hard. <laughs> uh, I, I, and I still don't even know if it's uh, thoroughly possible to meet all of the benchmarks uh, for success in this project. I've managed to get it to work under certain conditions, but not under the conditions in which I've promised uh, to fulfill the project. I had to, of course, learn some uh, computer programming. I had to become a, you know, a kind of a miniature version of Nick Montfort, you know, teaching myself a bit of uh, computer programming skills uh, to do it. I had to understand something, of course, about the mathematical uh, scale of the work. Uh, so I, you know, had to, you know, uh, dally with some of the uh, principles that Pedro probably understands. Uh, it, 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 it's a project that has required me to learn a lot of varied skills in order to be able to fulfill it. Yeah, and it uh, fulfills a lot of the things we've been talking about. Uh, in relation to mathematics because you've got a very limited vocabulary to use there, just a small set of possible words and or word letter combinations and the the structure is more important than what it says uh, but it's also got this level to this technological level to it because you are actually interfering with this bacterium so uh could you tell us a bit, bit more about that side of it um now the two poems would be implanted in a bacterium that is capable of surviving in all kinds of very hostile environments. Uh, you can scorch it, freeze it, wither it, and it won't die. Uh, it's capable of repairing its own DNA so quickly that it doesn't uh, evolve very easily. But, and for this reason, it might be a, an evolutionary dead end. It can't change very easily. But it's already so well adapted to the utter lethality of the universe that it doesn't need to change. Uh, it can survive a thousand times the dosage of gamma radiation that would instantly kill a human being. Um, it can survive in the open vacuum of outer space. We don't know what its native habitat is here on Earth because there's no environment that's capable of driving these evolutionary uh, affordances, except an extraterrestrial environment. So some sp scientists have perhaps speculated that it may have acquired some of these uh, immunities as a side effect of being evolved upon the planet Earth and then having been transmitted into outer space and returning later to uh, readapt to this environment. Um, by putting my poem into this bacterium, I might effectively be writing a, a text that would outlast terrestrial civilization, and it could be on the planet Earth when the sun explodes. I'm trying to write a poem that lasts forever. Uh, that's the technological character of that work, uh, the kind of uh, immortalization of poetry in a literal sense. Uh, because even though we pay lip service to the immortality of art, we haven't really uh, created any enduring means by which we could protect our culture against planetary disasters like thermonuclear warfare or astrophysical barrage. There seems to be an ethical dimension to protect uh, what we've acquired uh, culturally now. Uh, there's so many amazing things that we've learned and done, and to lose it would be a great uh, tragedy. Uh, certainly, you know, advances in uh, mathematics and in computer science, uh, you know, uh, would be lost if, uh, if our culture disappeared. And uh, we fought hard, I think, intellectually to make those advances. And so far as we know, we're the only creatures in the universe that understands these things. Uh, that's a, a great achievement. Um, I think it, you know, it's important that we find ways perhaps to uh, uh, conceptualize our uh, durability as a, as a culture. And it's interesting that you you don't want this to to just remain in theory. You actually want this, the experimental side to be a success. One of the constraints, of course, is that you have to at least produce one case. <laughs> you have to at least make one example of it. <laughs> Show that it can be done at least once. Um, Christian, you know, uh, in the history of robotics, uh, at some point, uh, certain robotics researchers decided um, it's very challenging to get all these wires to stay connected and to work with all the actuators and everything. And we'll separate out the mechanical engineering problems and we'll make the robots, simulated robots that uh, run mm. in the computer environment. And we'll work on things there. Um, you have a wet version of this situation that's even more complex and messy. Um, why not just be satisfied with the simulated version of the Xenotext? Why for you do you need to uh, have it in the organism um, and uh, working. Yeah, th these are, these are um, hard questions about uh, the role of success and failure in the understanding of what it means to be a poet. And poets uh, like to fail. They really are proud of failure. Uh, they, they go to a lot of trouble to try and uh, present failure as, as a kind of uh, humble form of success. 
And I kind I dislike this lack of ambition. I think <laughs> I've, I've come to dislike it. I, I mean, I, yeah. it, it, it seems attractive, but I've come to dislike it now because I, I don't like the kinds of people it produces. I think people should aspire to make things happen and should try to succeed. Failure is important because you learn from it. You figure out how to transcend it and you keep going after you've failed. Uh, certainly failure is useful in that respect, but to then to, to, to uh, praise it, like to imagine you've succeeded even though you haven't really accomplished anything is worrisome to me. And I, I, in this kind of project, I've done something that is a, a big promise and uh, it's a challenge, right? It's, it's a challenging constraint. It's easy to articulate, it's very hard to do. Um, uh, and it, it wouldn't be any fun if I knew how to do it. Like, like in some sense, if you know the outcome of the game before you play, the game is not that much fun to play, you know. You know. Okay, but, but how about this? What if you, if you're not going to change the actual Xenotext poem, right? If you've settled on that, you said, this is the poem, I found it. Um, then in that case, the failure to embed it in the genetic sequence of this particular bacterium um, isn't feeding back into your process, right? It becomes, you've made it into purely a, a genetic engineering and a biological problem. Right. So uh, would you actually, under any circumstances, go back and revise that? Uh, that's problem? a good question. Um, uh, there are ways I, I have left open uh, kind of footholds where it's possible for me to revise that poem, sit, pull out lines and remove them so they don't, uh, without altering it uh, dramatically. There's, um, I've, certainly, I've certainly left little keyholes like that that uh, make it possible for me to transform uh, the work easily. But I bear in mind, I haven't actually explored all of the options that I might have at my disposal for creating the protein. And uh, there's a lot of trial and error involved in conducting the experiment. Uh, there's a bit of voodoo, a bit of magic. Uh, there's a lot of unpredictability. We don't understand thoroughly yet how uh, proteins fold, uh, why, sure, sure. Uh, why they you know, take on these but, particular But food. ultimately, if your agent can't get it published you know, via the <laughs> organism, Right, you're gonna. It's like you, you're. You may go back and say, "Okay, let's try a poem half as long." Uh, it, it's true. I, I mean, I may very well have to do that. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping. I, I'm here's the thing. I, I haven't. I haven't gotten to the point in the process where I can begin to tamper with that yet. I haven't gotten okay. to that spot yet. Work. I've gotten it almost to work. It's I'm like I'm very close to getting it right. Uh, I and I did get it to work in a in a colony of E. coli in a relatively well understood organism. Uh, that was uh, already a big accomplishment, but I promised much more than that. So the challenge is, of course, that if you promise to put a chimpanzee on the moon and you put the chimpanzee in orbit, nobody cares. But it, it's pretty amazing that you might have gotten the chimpanzee into orbit. Um, uh, I wish I had. I wish I had just simply said, "Look, I'm going to get a bacterium to store a poem and write one in response." If I had said that, uh, I would be finished uh, because I've successfully done that. Uh, but I, I said instead, "No, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it last forever." <laughs> It'll be, in, it'll be in this particular organism. It's got to be in this one. Right. It's got to be. It's got to be the most surreal, you know, kind of most most uncanny, you know, uh, instantiation of the of the process. So. I I have a, a a thought and a question. I, I you mentioned that there are like you know trillion eight trillion variations that of the of the ciphers, and you have one, essentially one up to small tinkerings one meaningful poem in, in English. I wonder what happens in other natural languages. I, I mean, yeah, Pedro, I'm certainly curious about that. Yeah. But that's a job for someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> it was hard enough to do it in one language, to ask me to do it in another language. And yeah. I speak two languages very badly, right? French and English. French and uh, English. To do it in any other language, I think, would be uh, an immense challenge. Absolutely. Uh, it's already hard enough to do it in English. But if there is somebody, you know, who has the temerity to figure out if you can do it in Hawaiian or if you can do it in French, right? <laughs> uh, I would say go for it. But uh, it's, I, I don't think it's my responsibility. Like it's already hard enough no, to, no, do, no. to do it one. But, and I wouldn't wish people to do it. Like I would just say, look, it's actually harder than you think. You really have to be quite mad. I think to undertake <laughs> the project. You know? Go for it, Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're talking about, Christian, is essentially scientific methods, and you want to know if it can be done and you, you're willing to fail. It's truly exploratory. Like, I, I don't know what the, if the outcome will work or not. And uh, I would prefer not to give up. Like, I would just prefer to make sure that I've actually done an exhaustive search of, of the possibilities available to me. I mean, normally, uh, I don't know, the 
great example of Thomas Edison, you know, working through a thousand different materials before lighting on tungsten as the element that he uses in a light bulb. Um, yeah, well, a lot of my uh, constraint-based work, I could fail, you know, I've, I've done poems where I don't know if it actually works or not, if it's even possible to complete it, but the, the stakes aren't quite as high with that. Uh, well, you've done things that are absolutely, uh, uh, they're witchcraft. I mean, no, come on, you've done things that I think are, are really skirting the impossible. Uh, I'm very intimidated by some of those works. Uh, you know, I, I look at it and say, do that. I know well, I have the capacity It's a to question do that. as to whether failure is, uh, is really a requirement for experimental writing, because Burroughs, um, in writing about the cut-up method, you know, says it is experimental in that it is something to do. Mm -hmm. right? So he didn't actually require that you could fail at it, you know, yeah. or, or that you could succeed at it, right? That wasn't uh, what experimental meant from his perspective. Um, it just meant, as opposed to being theoretical, theoretical writing versus experimental writing. You could talk about it, which I guess is what we're doing now. We're doing theoretical writing in a certain sense. And then when we get down to producing the works, that's experimental. And the question of, you know, what, what failure means um, is a different one from Burroughs' standpoint anyway. Well, how, how, how does a, a mathematician fail? Or how does the computer scientist fail? I mean, the, I think those are pretty interesting questions, right? I mean, if I think the mathematician fails if they can't either prove or disprove the conjecture. Right? If they fail to prove or disprove something, and if they fail to prove that it is unprovable, <laughs> they, yeah, right. they the, fail to establish anything. They, they fail to settle. Right. Because, I mean, just to, to be concrete, like specifically the result that like any mathematical system that is capable of enumeration mm -hmm. cannot be complete and consistent. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, I mean, and, and we, that's established. There's yes. a successful proof of that, but at the same time, where, where does that lead us in terms yes. of yes. thinking about uh, I, I, I think that I think that those uh, moments uh, probably uh, show you boundary conditions, limit cases where uh, mathematics can take a fork in the road. Uh, you can, uh, if, if you have a, an unprovable um, uh, theorem, an unprovable conjecture, and you've demonstrated that, in fact, its truth value uh, is ambiguous. You, you, you could be true or not true. You can't tell. You could base an entire uh, branch of mathematics on the truth of that axiom just by, by presuming in advance that it's true. Or you could create a completely different kind of mathematics that would be predicated upon that axiom being untrue. And that fundamentally what, that is, what those little moments are in the history of mathematics are kinds of forks in the road where we are, we're, we're, we've hit a membrane where a new kind of mathematics, you know, could be created uh, and you've got two options to choose from uh, that, are, that are two different universes. Uh, I think that that's what we may learn from that. That may be the successful thing that we derive from somebody like Goodell's uh, assumption. I don't know. Yeah, that, yeah, sounds, the... that sounds very positive to me. Do you think that's why Goodell starved himself to death, Pedro? <laughs> Well, yeah, well, I think with, with um, uh, Cohen's proofs of uh, independence, for example, the independence of uh, the axiom of choice and all of these uh, famous mathematical uh, statements, what you end up with is a, is a set theory that, that has a multiverse, mm -hmm. essentially what, what Christian is talking about. So there's, there's a, a variety of universes of set theory. And, um, and you can study, in, indeed, what happens in this in this universe, what happens in this other universe? Uh, certain hypotheses lead to certain. And, and in, in fact, you can start asking yourself questions about the sociology of mathematics, like or the, the cultural history of mathematics. Why do we live in a in, in a set theory? Why do we have Sir Melo Frankel? Right? Like, why do we have the particular set theory that we have? Why don't we have other axioms that? Well, probably because of cultural reasons. Right. Because of historical reasons. Uh, and uh, I mean, ultimately, like um, uh, Lake of Nunez, you know, talking about the metaphorical grounding of mathematics, uh, you know, go to the extreme of mm -hmm. saying, I mean, it comes down to the body, it comes down to the human body. The most common I idea about that that's in the popular consciousness is that we've got 10 fingers and we use, you know, base 10. But uh, even more simply that, you know, the idea that, for instance, you have a number line that has positive numbers, negative numbers, you start at zero, you know, corresponds to taking steps toward or away from some destination in a linear way. 
And uh, the idea that a uh, particular human bodily experience um, kinesthetic related to motor skills and control um, related to uh, the engagement with objects in the world um, and also uh, related to neurophysiology uh, of perception and of cognition and so forth um, is what gives us our mathematics, right? So that's a very different idea than this sort of concept that, you know, two plus two equals four would be true even if there were no matter in the universe. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, do, what do you all think about that, by the way? <laughs> Which side do you come down on? The, the uh, Lake of Nunez idea that, you know, metaphor, metaphor, uh, metaphor uh, is, is what, and, and the body and the particular neurophysiological situation of man is what mathematics emerges out of? Or so that I it's an abstraction, yeah. I, I, I like the, the idea and, um, uh, of Lake of, uh, um, and uh, I'm sympathetic, but functionally, I'm a Platonist. I'm a mathematician. Okay. I okay. cannot operate intellectually with, without some giving, granting some ontological sure. status to the sure. objects that I am working with. So for all functional, practical purposes, I, you know, I think mathe yeah. mathematical statements are true in every possible world because I can't function without that. Um, it's psychologically very hard to do so. Yeah, I have to say, I, I agree with Pedro. I'd be like, you know, the mathematical statements will be true no matter what your physiology is. Your ability to discover them, perhaps, or invent them might be uh, uh, dependent to some degree upon it. But once discovered, once I know there are achievements unlocked. I, like you, you've managed, you've managed to learn something that everybody should be able to know, right? Right. They're, they're just achievements that you've unlocked in the great video game, uh, and it could be right that in order to unlock that door that leads to your understanding of that number theory, right, you have to get the uh, magic slippers and the and have ten hand ten digits on your hand. I don't like like all of the various kinds of evolutionary traits that you know accompany making that discovery. But once you've discovered it, it's it's true, you know, like it's just buried there. You can't, it's unignorable. Anybody can find it, I suppose, right? Like it's just going to be, it's, it's going to be true for every in intelligence, you know. Uh, it, it, I, I, that would be my, my premise. I mean, it could be there's lots of mathematical truths that we don't, uh, haven't discovered mm -hmm. yet or haven't even considered yet. Yeah. Uh, but what's wonderful to me is that they, they're all derivable from the, the simplest, perhaps most primordial discoveries, right? That they, they all somehow interlock with each other into a grand scheme. And uh, there's something about poetic discoveries, I think, that are, could be similar, you know, that the, the certain kinds of poetic uh, permissions suddenly enable new avenues of exploration and interest and uh, expression that would otherwise uh, go unacknowledged or unexamined. Uh, um, for example, I, uh, I'm very impressed uh, by uh, Anthony because I think that he's made a, an important contribution to the history of constraint with the invention of uh, palindromes that are not uh, single letter units. I was just about uh, to mention fact, the general case being the alindrome, this, you know, this nonce mm -hmm. word which describes these forms of palindromes that have uh, disparate uh, units for the uh, reversal of the message. Uh, that's, a, that's a discovery that I can't believe hadn't been already made. Like, you know, it's in, kind of incredible that in the history of, of that form, uh, you have this unlocked, you know, up until then, locked potential, now only recently unlocked. It, uh, who knows what, what kinds of things that discovery might inspire, right? what we might learn from, uh, from just that uh, shift in our understanding of a set of rules. It's very yeah. helpful. Well, envious wait, of that. I'm kind of envious of that. Like, you know, the, the, I mean, I, I feel like I've made some big contributions uh, to poetry, but, uh, you know, I... I, I'm not responsible for as many as I'd like, <laughs> and I think that this is this is a good one. Like I'm, like, I'm, I'm very impressed by that one. I do think that that you're both very interested in scaring people away from the particular poetic forms uh, <laughs> or formats in which you work, rather than encouraging other people to partake of those forms. No, they just have to be worthy. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Now, I think Anthony wants to probably tell us a little bit more about that particular uh, constraint because it's informed by mathematical attitudes, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the, yeah. the alindromic structures are often informed by interesting constants from mathematics and cool numbers, you know, like from, from history of number theory. So maybe he wants to elaborate a little bit on this really great idea. So the alindromes, yeah. Uh, the constraint is essentially that you, instead of having a single letter as a unit in the palindrome, 
you can take a numerical sequence and reverse it and have that many letters in each unit. This is, uh, well, it's the palindrome multiverse, I guess. We were just talking about something similar. Pedro has been very kind in calling it the generalized form of palindromes. All palindromes are just a subset of alindromes. And that's my, that's my one contribution to mathematical poetry, I think. So one of the things I want to ask uh, Pedro about um, a related question, which is that sometimes the units actually get changed on you. If you, if you were to actually follow the um, Academia Real, uh, you know, the, or the, uh, the uh, Real Academia uh, rules for um, Spanish um, uh, um, orthography for the Spanish alphabet, prior to maybe it was in the early 90s there was a change is that right Pedro? yes okay yes. so you had um che are and ele were mm -hmm. letters and there would be dictionary headings yes. you know for these right and then at the, at, they're like no we're not going to have those be letters anymore when no more che it'll be c and h right so that means uh uh the authorities um actually would have uh, would have changed what's a palindrome or not. Correct. In fact, it, it, it happened. You know, the, the, there used to be palindromes that would treat the, the, the digraph CH yeah. as a single letter. And those are no longer considered palindromes. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I, that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great story. So isn't this, but isn't this a great example of how the Platonic idea, right, of mathematics <laughs> being independent, right? If you actually, the, the problem is, the problem is you always get culture, politics, even, yeah. you know, society always gets uh, mixed up in this. Uh, I mean, obviously, over historical periods of time, you know, like the letter W gets added to the French alphabet um, mm. and so forth. But, uh, uh, but it happens during our lifetime, too. <laughs> We did. We, we did yes. Like it. <laughs> yes, it did. Now, I understand from uh, my friends uh, here who write palindromes that those digraphs are, in fact, uh, one of the more challenging features of the constraint. And, and Anthony's and also brought, letter H. brought back the thorn. That's right. Because of the thorn in our side, the, the uh, TH uh, is in English, right? Yeah. The, 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 yeah. Those, are, those are challenges. And in fact, the side effect of which is that H, uh, a relatively common letter, uh, tends not to be so common in palindromes because mm -hmm. it's typically appearing in digraphs that are hard to transpose, right? Hard to reverse. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things that, that made... That, that's an interesting feature of the language. You just you, you learn something about uh, the limitations that are edifying. Like I look at that and say, that's a pretty interesting discovery, you know, that everybody eventually discovers, right? They all, they all end up running aground on that particular problem. Yeah, yeah, one, of the yeah problems, one of the big problems that uh, happened with the U2 sonnets was that the first one I wrote was a palindrome by pairs. And in the palindrome by pairs, of course, it's very easy to use the letter H. And then so when I, when I came to write the palindrome by letter that had to be an anagram of it, it was a mm. fucking nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, this is, I was, you know, I was once asked uh, the question during, during an interview of, you know, what, what do you, what do you have to do to be a, you know, palindrome writer? Like, what are the special skills? And I say, well, you know, being literate is the really important thing. <laughs> uh, because, it, it, uh, of course, it makes no sense in an oral culture to think about palindromes the way we think about them. There are things that I would consider palindromes by syllable, like phonetic net phone, uh, which actually we're speaking yes. on a phonetic net phone right now. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but first of all, there's very few of these cases that are warranted. I don't know where we would, uh, you know, or that are actually published. There's not a, a body of them, whereas people know palindromes by letter. Uh, they're part of the ordinary cultural consciousness, you know, um, popular thinking. Uh, so uh, the fact that language is broken down into uh, these units of writing to these particular letters, characters, glyphs, um, you know, is the uh, is the essence of this. And again, that's that's also something that's historically contingent that we uh, we develop that from oral language. Yes, yes, and I I, I wanted to add that um, uh, that that issue of the distribution of letters in uh, in in ordinary language and in palindromes is very interesting. Uh, Anthony and I, for example, uh, wrote a pair of sonnets in conversation, one in Spanish and one in English, mm -hmm. 
that are perfect anagrams of each other. And um, the, the, the process was very, it was fascinating, wasn't it, Anthony? Like, it was really hard for us to get it done. Uh, initially, I wrote a, a sonnet in Spanish about um, rearranging furniture because my wife has that. He, she loves to rearrange furniture in the house. I'm a very um, territorial animal, so it, it, it makes me uncomfortable. But um, I wrote a sonnet in Spanish, and then Anthony translated it into English or put it in conversation, wrote something in English, a sonnet in English in conversation with it. And the natural distributions of letters in Spanish and English are very different. Yes. So we had as to a scrabble, as scrabble sets will tell exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So we had to engage in a back and forth process where I would write a sonnet in Spanish uh, in response to Anthony's in English, and he would write one converging in distribution of letters. So uh, eventually we found two sonnets that had the same distributions of letters. That process was harder, uh, more time consuming for me um, than, for example, producing two palindromic sonnets that are anagrams of each other. And something that I have done in Spanish and Anthony, you have done in English as well. Um, somehow the relative distributions of letters of, in palindromic texts is a little bit more similar. So it's a little easier. Uh, of course, there's also the fact that the length of a sonnet palindromically in terms of letters is half of the length of a, 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 just a traditional sonnet. But, but um, yeah, all Don't of these things... Don't tell people how to do it, Pedro. Huh? <laughs> Don't tell people how to do it. I know. Oh, well, one of the things, right, so, so uh, I mean, uh, Inye comes up le much less often in English than it does in Spanish, right? That's one of the letter letter distribution issues. Absolutely. Um, Anthony would uh, say, can you get rid of those weird things with the tilde? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to put a pinante in my palindrome. You know, it's like, uh, what, uh, help me out. But, but actually, in this, it's originally the double N. Uh, like, very, you know, very, very early. Um, is that right, Pedro? Is that the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a double N. Originally. Yeah, so it's again, it's it just we just change the glyph, and then I have uh, one of the rules for um Spanish palindrome do you do you have to have an inye on the other side? Yeah, an inye is 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 a letter in Spanish, okay? So you, you can because in, uh, in French it doesn't matter whether you have the cicidil or oh, interesting, c yeah, uh huh, the cedilla, yeah, 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 I did not know that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean the French alphabet is twenty six letters. Yeah, that's as every every French person. Is, I'm, I'm always interested to ask. That's one of the, you know, com, back when back when we could travel, I would always ask people, you know, how many letters in other countries? How many how many letters are in your alphabet? <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and and the French, you know, I mean, of course, you ask a French person this, and they, they look at you like you're asking how many fingers are in their hand you know <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very but, but i asked this in slovakia and mm -hmm. we actually we ended up someone had to had to send a text message to to the to the the main figure in like slovak orthography in order to answer the question like no wow. actually no one no one could figure it out because i mean you could even the the ways that you do this is you go through the dictionary and you look at how many headings there are but there's some letters that never begin words. Of course, yeah. And there's still letters. <laughs> so, yeah. So that used to happen in Spanish, uh, as you mentioned, the double yeah. R was a letter, and it was not. Yeah. It's never the beginning of a of a word. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're straying from science here. <laughs> <laughs> it's all ultimately science, though. Uh, there's one thing uh, that we talked about earlier. I'd like to go back to the idea of failure and setting challenges. For example, palindromic sonnets that Pedro and I have written many of. I think you've written a few million more than me recently. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> With computer assistance. <laughs> um, but of course, the, the goal when you're writing a palindromic sonnet is to write a sonnet that reads like it isn't palindromic. You want it, you want it to be as clear as possible, which never happens. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's just beyond language, I think. It's never going to happen, but you still have to look for it. So to some extent, you're accepting failure there. And I think surely something similar, Nick, something similar would happen with computer-generated writing, at the moment anyway. Would you find it less interesting if, if a computer-generated novel was perfect and indistinguishable? 
I would find it much less interesting, yes. Um, because uh, I particularly use computation. I undertake programming to try to explore language in ways that uh, I wouldn't as you know, an ordinary writer or even as a constrained writer um, setting a particular process or procedure for myself. Um, so I want something actually to challenge the way in which we read. Like I'm looking to, uh, not to make it imp uh, utterly impossible to read you know, in any way, uh, but to propose that we must learn to read in new ways. Um, so for me, uh, uh, I have a, I'm not trying to create, you know, what, what uh, Charles Bernstein calls an, a, an absorptive uh, type of experience or text. Um, I'm very much trying to um, uh, resist that idea and to also uh, invite people into the question of how the text is generated and what it's doing. And I, I, I generate you know, different sorts of text for, for very different reasons. So sometimes there's this very specific starting point. I have a, a book called Megawatt, um, which is a type of absurdly expanded version of many of the most illegible parts of Samuel Beckett's second novel, Watt. Uh, those passages in the original Watt are already illegible from my standpoint. I mean, you could actually read every word of them out loud if you wanted to, but you can't understand them in a typical way, uh, or at least I can't. And so actually programming a book that, uh, programming a computer program that was able to generate the original passages and then also was generalized to be able to expand them Right. So for me, that was a way of reading what, like I actually, you know, became, uh, I thought, a better, uh, uh, more thorough, uh, uh, more engaged reader of this book uh, by doing that. Um, and then, you know, I'd say, so that was translated by Hannes Bjor into German. And so that's an example of someone who, you know, read my work very thoroughly, but also perhaps had that perspective and that insight that I gained um, into Beckett's work. But that's only one of the things I, I do. So, so again, uh, the real way of reading that, I, don't, I, would, I would think it very unlikely that, that Hannes went and actually put his eyes on every one of the generated words. That's not the way to read that book from my perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but he definitely put his eyes on every piece of the code and translating it to German. Um, and there's, there's other books like The True List um, and like Golem that I, I do expect, you know, the, a, a dedicated reader to, to read all of um, in somewhat of a standard way, but uh, also in new ways. But do you think it would, it would be something to aspire to, to try to computer generate a book that could pass as a real novel? No, <laughs> I don't. I don't. I'm not interested. I, I'm not interested in. I mean, passing is a good way to, to put it, right? Which is which is sort of like um, like uh, uh, being able to uh, present yourself as a, a member of a privileged, you know, ra racialized group, for instance. You know, notice that is like um, the the idea of making literature that passes for human, like computer generating literature that passes for human. It doesn't interest me for a variety of reasons. One of which is like, if we wanted to, like why computer generate novels that, that just read like the, the novels that we already have a surfeit of, there's, there's too many, right? We don't need, it's, it's sort of like the, the question of like generating things that, uh, that actually look like human authored haiku. It's like, why do that? There's too much. We already have too, you know, too many uh, people writing haiku and, and too many haiku being produced. We don't need to computer generate more. The exception would be if you're actually doing uh, simulative work and you're trying to create like a cognitive science model. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do that, I would say go for it. Uh, but if you're doing it as an aesthetic project, 
<laughs> Pedro's shaking his head. It's like, why, why, no, why do that? I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, um, I, I begin, uh, so, so I, I re recently read a book called uh, Close Calls with Nonsense. It's a book by um, an American uh, literary critic, Stephen Burt. And um, one of the recurrent themes is, of course, that, that uh, contemporary poetry has this flirtation with nonsense. And, um, uh, but it all re always returns to, to meaning, right, in, one, in some way. And for me, my trajectory sometimes as a, as a heavily constrained writer, which is one of my, my identities as a, as a, as a, as a poet, is, is precisely the opposite trajectory. I start in nonsense land or in uh, the bi-directional straitjacket of the palindrome or what have you. And, uh, and my flight to Vicarus is exactly uh, in the reverse direction. I, I, I try to cross into the land of meaning. And uh, of course, there's some failure implicit in that. There's a, the fall of Icarus to the ground, right? Um, but, uh, but, but, but it seems to me, or at least that's how I understand my, my own work, uh, that they, they, they serve a purpose in, in the culture that is very different from what I would crudely call entertainment, right? <laughs> entertainment is, is, um, is for easy consumption, but this kind of product, cultural product, it, it actually really uh, begs for a different kind of engagement from, from, from the consumer of the, of the product. Um, I recently read a, uh, an article, very interesting article by a neuroscientist at Tufts called uh, Eric Hall, and I forget the, the title of the article, but it is about, um, about deep neural, uh, neural networks and learning and memory and uh, the, the need for dreams to aid human beings generalize. So deep neural networks get, it, get into a, a problem when they are being when when they are in, uh, learn when they're learning, they have these uh, learning algorithms, right? And uh, and this problem of overfitting. So deep neural networks in, end up being overfitted to specific patterns, and you need to throw at them some noise in order to avoid the trap of overfitting. And Eric Hall conjectures that dreams do something akin to that for human cognition that we, we end up having this problem of overfitting if we do not have um, sufficiently wildly dissimilar experiences or uh, events in our cognition and that that's what dreams are there for and that there is evidence for this. Now it's conjecture, it's a conjecture, it's not completely established, but it's a very ambitious uh, program, scientific program. And uh, I think that in culture, um, we also have a need as a culture, as a distributed set of agents, cognitive agents, to, to, to consume things that, that actually challenge us, challenge our self-understanding and, and aid us to generalize, to understand ourselves as a culture, as a far more uh, expansive uh, community. And uh, so, so I completely agree, Nick. I, I, I understand the the impulse and the the question that the scientific curiosity of for example producing a, a computer generated novel that passes it, it's actually interesting to me it's like a Turing test mm -hmm. but on the other hand I think that there is something more uh, interesting artistically aesthetically about generating uh, work that is challenging current uh, readerly conventions. Yeah, I mean, I want, the goal for me in, in, in so in terms of what I would consider success, so for instance, uh, if one of my computer generated books is translated, I know that I had one reader, right? I, like one real reader who really engaged with it closely, uh, you know, even a, a critic writing a review. I'm not the sure. The proofreader. <laughs> yeah, but, but the person who actually translated the book, I know that person that, that person read it. Um, so that that would be one example of success. I mean, I, I, I like having that work be a source for something that goes into a different uh, language community also, you know. 
but uh, but for me, that's that's a measure of success. Um, but uh, the idea that it would, if if I, if I were to computer generate something that read in a perfectly ordinary way, uh, that that see, that did pass for human. Um, so for one thing, people's response, I'm sure, would be just to be to be dazzled by it, uh, assuming they believe me. They say, oh, that's a, that's amazing. Um, and I want people to look at something that's uncanny, culturally resonant in some way, but definitely alien, definitely non-human. And I want them to think, how was that done? Um, and to think that question, how was that done? Not just in an abstract way, but you know, at least for some of the people, the way the translator has to actually undertake that and figure out no, really, how was that done, right? So to me, sort of, I, I'm trying to pose a, a riddle that someone is actually going to seek the answer to. Yeah, I see a lot of that with constraint-based writing too. But when you allow yourself to use multiple constraints and you allow the meaning to get lost, it's, it is an opportunity for people to discover their, their own meaning. Uh, well, not only their own meaning, but also uh, there's different people uh, have, having different opinions about whether you should even reveal what the constraint is. So, you know, Harry Matthews, uh, you know, uh, might not, um, I mean, there's um, selected declaration of dependence, which has some information about the constraints, for instance, but, um, uh, but you know, uh, hasn't uh, uh, never said what the constraints were. Except to except to translators, he had to tell the translators, right? But uh, never said that. And yet, um, uh, in your own work, Anthony, and also in other uh, Pederac Press publications, right? The answers are in the back. You you explain what the what the constraints are, right? So wh why that why that choice? Why uh, why give the answer P? It divides opinion. This this subject, doesn't it? Whether to give the answers away. I've always been in that camp. I've always thought just. Maybe it's an ego thing, like, hey, everyone, look what I've done. This but you don't, you don't put them in the front, right? Oh, sorry, why that choice? Uh, well, I mean, no, no. There's one question is why to include them at all, and the other, yeah. the other question is why to put them at the end. Right? Yeah, it's not. It's nice to give people the choice to, to, uh, to read it, knowing what's going on, or to first read it without knowing. And it feels well, like this isn't there a scientific? Like, isn't there a scientific rationale to show your work? Right, and to be able to uh, yeah, help you, yourself a little you bit. Can, you could you can also put it in supplementary information. You know, if we're talking about scientific publication, it, it, it's can, true. But uh, uh, the book of poetry, is, book a of poetry book. is a testament. <laughs> right? I'm saying the book of poetry is always a testament to uh, something you've done. Now, if if it's a, if it's purely a work of expression, you don't have to divulge much. But I think that if you're attempting to do something exploratory, uh, trying to do something generative. You're hoping to pass on a skill set to somebody else, right? That, that the important thing is is that you're transferring uh, what you've learned, right? You're making you've made a discovery. You're hoping that you can actually inspire others to emulate what you've done, and perhaps expand the boundaries of it a little bit. And it uh, th there's a, some usefulness in showing people uh, this is what I did. Here's how I did it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, on the one hand, you know, Anthony, of course, would like to be able to say, uh, "Look at my wizardry." Uh, I understand Harry Matthews, though, thinking that I'm a magician and I like I don't want to show you how I pulled that rabbit out of the hat, right? There's something uh, embarrassing about divulging the nature of the trick. Mm -hmm. And certainly, you know, there's a long uh, secret tradition of magicians who will not divulge how they do things. And of course, then there are the naysaying kind of uh, magicians, I don't know, a, a pen and Teller gang, right? Mm -hmm. who, would, who would proceed to divulge <laughs> the secrets of, what, of, of other people's tricks. In, or, in order to highlight how they could do the same trick without you knowing how it's done, once you've been shown how it's done. Like there's, there's uh, you know, the, ki the kind of uh, uh, idea that perhaps by showing somebody how you've done something, you might inspire somebody to run away and join the circus with you. I think that's yeah. what, you know, the nature of a magic trick is. The, sure. the magic show is designed to make you want to become, you know, a, a, a practitioner of magic shows. Mm -hmm. I think there's something in the nature of yeah. poetry that has a similar impulse at play within it. You know, like you're trying to convince people to run away and join the circus with you, right? Yeah. And, and if it, I read a beautiful poem by Pedro, if I read an extraordinary uh, computer-generated riddle by Nick Montfort, if I, you know, read some, uh, you know, witchcraft uh, of a palindrome by Anthony Theron, every one of those kinds of events makes me want to run away and join the circus, right? Like, just simply do that instead, right? Try to, try to um, 
learn the skills that that did you know in which somebody's done something so wonderful. Yeah, it's not just a matter of inspiration, and and I should say you know I you know one of the things that I generally do is uh, not only make my code available, but you know I make it available as free software to explicitly allow people to uh, study it, to redistribute it, to modify it, to create their own projects based on it. Yeah, that, that's tantamount um, to putting the uh, answer key at the back, in my opinion, Nick. That's the same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly the uh, same thing. And, I, and believe me, I think that's an extraordinary is resource. an exception to this in a particular way, but that's, <laughs> that's also for, that's for a reason. And the text of Golem is Creative Commons license, so it is available to anyone. But, uh, but I think the other thing is it's, it's more than just, you, you've highlighted this aspect of inspiration, you know, running away to, to join the circus, but, it, but it's actually, uh, there's some aspect of, I guess at an extreme, you'd say um, uh, pedagogy, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, you really want to um, uh, not just provoke people to start doing this, but um, uh, explain some about how it's done. I mean, for me, um, my interest in um, enabling people who don't have programming experience to use computation as programmers to learn about programming very generally uh, is resonant and uh, consonant with my making the source code to computer generated book projects available. Right? So that's to me very consistent. Um, and uh, uh, it's, 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 it's part of a scientific attitude, right? That you're supposed to demystify uh, the process and make it available to as many people as possible because it's a very powerful right, tool. Right. But there's and, different and, reasons. And, there's different reasons people do that. As you pointed out earlier, right? Sometimes it's so that results can be replicated, mm -hmm. right? But, and that's for your peers who are already trained as scientists. Mm -hmm. um, but you might want to do it so that people actually learn. Um, that's right. That, that, that's what I'm trying to do. I mean, I'm a pedagogue, right? And it, 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 the, my, the, the, the most important lesson I think I teach my own students is it's all demystification, right? They, they want to mystify the process. And if you start showing them that, hey, look, it's, there's some carpentry here, there's engineering involved in this. There's, in fact, some mechanical engineering. You don't even have to think about this. If you just follow this particular kind of rule when you write, it always works, right? You, you, like it's, it's, it's a simple, a simple task. Like it's, you, you don't have to make it harder on yourself. Uh, like providing skill sets is a very useful uh, feature of um, training uh, in the arts and poetry. And I think we underestimate it a little bit, you know, that, 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 that um, uh, it's important to be able to enable others. I, I think I'm the kind of poet who really just cares about talent. And I think that, you know, job is pretty much to inspire people to adopt skills, right? You're trying to make, you're trying to make discoveries and share those discoveries in a way which makes it possible for people to do something with greater ease, right? Like they want them to be able to enter into this milieu um, uh, armed, right? With really, really good tools. Um, I feel like I am the the the, the misbehaving scientist here because uh, I feel more like Alan Sokal, who's also a scientist. And mm -hmm. I, I, I actually have a, I submitted a, a, a poem to an anthology mm -hmm. and uh, the editors do not yet know that it is a palindrome. So... I did not disclose. <laughs> oh, well, you, you can do that. I mean, on, yeah. honestly, that there are lots of there are lots of poems that I've published where there are Easter eggs that people have never discovered, and you know, you mm -hmm. can say, you can take pleasure in that. I think it's a very private kind of pleasure to take, and in mm -hmm. in you know, the, the magician's pleasure, right, in knowing a secret that the audience doesn't know. I mean, there's a pleasure in that. That's why I think a lot of people become academics and they become you know priests and cults, right? It's that I know something you don't know. No, 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 no. Yeah. Like, like that, there's a pleasure yeah. in that. I, I totally I, sympathize with that. I think that's actually yeah. a perfectly aesthetically, you know, valid thing to, to, to do, like to play that little trick upon your editors, right? I'm, I'm submitting a palindrome and I didn't divulge it. There's exactly. immense pleasure in that. But in the yeah. avant-garde, I would say that my concern about uh, experimental writing is that the notion of the, you know, the pleasure of the text, right? That jouissance that uh, Roland Barthes identifies. Uh, there's a certain class of avant-garde poet who reserves that pleasure only for themselves and does mm -hmm. not bequeath it to the reader very generously. And it's tantamount to the magician, the kind of magician who mystifies the process and says, I know something you don't know, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? And you derive, some, you derive a prankish pleasure from that, uh, a little bit of hoax. hoax but the, the magician provides a wondrous spectacle and uh, opens up the possibility uh, of things that go beyond, you know, ordinary perception. If the magicians don't tell us how the trick works, 
but they provide us that sense of wonder. Sure. We still like that. I like knowing what Anthony did in the, in the, in the poems, right? Like, the, yeah. I like knowing that yeah. this is a work of witchcraft, but yeah, I never I really how. divulge how it was done, right? Like, I'm not going to know the full details of the, yeah. of the practice, right? Like, he's a, he's a magician. He's not like, to go back to Harry Matthews, if you read Cigarettes, you know, it's a wonderful book, right? It's a magisterial and, book. That's a and, book. And, and, and you and don't so, need to know. You may not need to know the right. constraints in order to appreciate its merits. Exactly. Of so the, the problem, yeah. I, I think the problem is the lack of wonder. You can make your choice about, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's true. I'm just saying that there's a certain case of the, the avant-garde that is suffering, I think, from a lethal dose of seriousness, uh, uh, that, that it lacks a, a, you know, the kind of whimsical character of play and wonderment. It doesn't really feel inspired by categories of beauty and terror that, you know, uh, used to characterize, you know, many of the reasons we mm-hmm. do something. I just want to make something beautiful. Right? Mm-hmm. I want to make something that is really... Um, uh, intricate and lovely and elegant, right? I want to make something that is actually, you know, uh, uh, sublime and uncanny, spooky, right? No, it's got to, it doesn't participate in that, those kinds of aesthetic categories much. And as a consequence, we don't walk away very satisfied, right? Uh, the poet who wrote that, of course, might feel very satisfied. Mm-hmm. But I, I do think that you have to find, uh, you have to create something that's sufficiently um, uh, uh, textured enough so that people can find reasons to appreciate it, even if they don't understand all of it, if they don't like all of it, at least it sounds lovely, or it's got pretty colors, or it's, it, you know, it's, it, it, it makes them feel good, like whatever the, whatever the response should be. Uh, uh, it, it's challenging right now. The, 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 the parameters under, uh, for expression as a poet are highly narrowed. You know, they're very... You know, from my standpoint, you know, sort of being culturally resonant is more important than the, than the pretty colors. Um, uh, uh, the pretty colors are the pretty colors are, are, are cross cultures, Nick. Like culturally resonant is like the here and now. I don't know. You gotta you gotta aspire for all time, right? Like, uh, so why is Shakespeare so so popular worldwide? Pretty colors. <laughs> Do you think so? Do you think so? It's, it's, it's thematically because... profound. It, I mean, of course, <laughs> but it it's beautiful writing. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just beautiful all the time. <laughs> Uh, how long have we got? Because Nick mentioned a minute ago that... Uh, probably like 10 minutes for me because I'm actually supposed to supposed to start something at 11. So. Was it well, I'm supposed to start something on the, on the hour, six, six minutes from now. Six minutes, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, well, sh- shall we uh, come to some conclusions? Just to figure here. out how to conclude. Uh, <laughs> I want to say how stimulating it was a really good conversation uh, for the likes of me. I hope it uh, is so for your listenership. And, and for me, it's it's a joy and an honor to to have been in conversation. I mean, I hope it's useful for listeners too. I feel like this is the type of conversation that, uh, you know, uh, trained on an uh, adequate corpus of uh, of our own uh, com- uh, sorts of writings and and works that you know GPT three could just generate this uh, conversation that we're having. It's not. Uh, and, 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 uh, I don't know what conclusion we're going to go toward, but it may be that you know that uh, it provides for for us the the dream state that that Peter was talking about. You know that uh, is is provocative in our in our own uh, thinking, our own poetics. Yeah, thank you, thanks, thank you, thanks, thank you, Anthony, for having me on. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, yes. To discover more, visit us at pentrackpress.com.